The following is a Furnished Brothers production. Introducing your host, Rob. Put your best players out there, Mike. And Ryan. He missed the net, and it somehow went in. This is the Talking Buds Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 21 of the Talking Buds podcast. Happy trade deadline day to you and yours, but more importantly, Ryan, happy belated birthday to you. Thank you, and I promise you, this morning when Trade Center started, I was not up and I was not watching. You weren't watching? You know what? I was up getting ready for work and I flipped on the Sportsnet trade deadline coverage just to see it kick off at 8 a.m. Well, to be fair, I'm like a car guy. So, like, I'm usually in the car. I got the fan on. I got TSN 1050 on. So maybe I wasn't watching it on TV, but I was was keeping up with it over over the radio. So it was quite the day. Hours and hours and hours of trade deadline coverage and then the Maple Leafs defeating the Buffalo Sabres by a score of 5 to 3. Before we get in and analyze and break down the game, Ryan, it was a really exciting game, a typical Leaf win, let's be honest. Let's talk some trade deadlines. So the Maple Leafs pretty quiet all day, and then right at the very end, it was reported that they had traded Par Lindholm to the Winnipeg Jets in exchange for center Nick Patan, a straight-up one-for-one deal. Presumably, Nick Patan will compete for a spot on the fourth line with the Maple Leafs. That's the type of player he was with the Winnipeg Jets. Although he hasn't played a lot this season. When you pull up his numbers, he's played 13 games, has two assists. So he he really hasn't seen a lot of ice time this year. Ryan, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I know a whole hell of a lot about Nick Patan. Do you know anything? Well, when I think of Nick Patan, I just think about him on the World Juniors. That's the only thing I know him buy so I think this deal is more just getting a guy out of the lineup who was just one of those guys who was like he's a penalty killer which really means he's useless so let's throw him on the penalty kill taking him away from Mike Babcock maybe yeah like I'm not we're not gonna sit here and be like we know everything about Nick Batan he was in a tough position in Winnipeg Winnipeg Great hockey team, tons of depth like the Maple Leafs, just couldn't find a spot in the lineup. It was the maybe it was the coach, maybe it was the general manager, who knows? We've seen this situation in Toronto with several guys, a guy who just can't find his way in the lineup. So maybe he'll get a chance here, but I like seeing guys like Trevor Moore get a chance with a with a trade of Parlin home. Well, when it was announced earlier today that Moore had been called up and would be playing in tonight's game against the Buffalo Sabres, everyone instantly was like, Oh, that means they're gonna make a deal. And Connor Brown's name actually floated around today as someone they might possibly be moving out but that didn't end up materializing well it's just like you know what Connor Brown I know all he's kind of a whipping boy right now but it's like what are you gonna get for Connor Brown like don't give me this you should have threw him in the trade with Wayne Simmons it's like no one wants Connor Brown if you wanted to get rid of Connor Brown and get something you should have traded him two years ago and I know that wasn't Dubas that was Lou Lamorello but Right now, if you're a sensible general manager, if you have a sensible scouting staff, you know that Connor Brown will ultimately bring, at best, third-line minutes to your hockey team. So shortly after the deadline and the deal was made, about 4 p.m.-ish, maybe a little bit after, Kyle Dubas came out and spoke to the media. 
and said all the things that every GM says every trade deadline. You know, you're not everybody. It's a busy day. The phone doesn't stop ringing, blah, blah, blah. And then spoke about the Patan acquisition. Just said what we said. It's a depth pickup, a guy who's going to compete for ice time on the fourth line. But he made an interesting comment that said he fits the way we want to play. Nick Patan is a not a tough guy. He's a skilled player. Yes, he's five foot nine, 180 pounds. Right. So when I heard that quote, Ryan, I was kind of like, yep, there it is, this management group. You've heard me say it for weeks and weeks. This isn't a, um, a group that buys into the whole toughness narrative. This management team is about skill and speed and possession and the analytic side and the analytical way of thinking, right? So I was like, yes, this makes sense that they would go out and get this. But then tonight, during the first intermission, Bob McKenzie reports that the Leafs were actively trying to pick up Wayne Simmons from the Philadelphia Flyers, who ended up going to the Nashville Predators, or Michael Furland, but the price was just too high. So to your point earlier, I'm sure Connor Brown was part of the deal they were offering, and both those teams were like, no. But that contradicts the whole, this management team doesn't care about toughness way of thinking that I was thinking. So, did that surprise you to hear that? That definitely surprised me to hear that. Well, you know what? Like, Wayne Simmons, I know people, like, when you you think about grit, and you're like, hey, let's get Wayne Simmons. He's a tough guy. I'll drop the gloves. But let's not forget, Wayne Simmons is one of the best power play scorers in the National Hockey League. He has been for the past couple of years now. So, when you're picking up a guy like Wayne Simmons, you're not just picking up a grit guy like this is a guy who can also like put the puck in the net and can contribute on your power play and could contribute offensively so that would probably be like he's he's to me there's a big difference between Wayne Simmons and Michael Furland Michael Furland has proved nothing in terms of contributing offensively in this league and Wayne Simmons playing for the Flyers all he's really done is could show that he can pot a bunch of power play goals and get a bunch of power play points so I think those are two different hockey players but when you look at the price that Nashville paid to get Wayne Simmons like that you know what it wasn't too high no it wasn't it wasn't so maybe I've never seen like I'm not gonna sit here and, and know everything about Ryan Hartman but maybe Ryan Hartman was like a Caspery Kapanen Kapanen equivalent to the Philadelphia Flyers when it comes to like the players that they kind of wanted. So we don't know, really know for sure, but really if you look at the price, like it's not outrageously high. Like they didn't give up a first round pick. They gave up a a decent player in in a late round pick. Like it's really not that steep of a price, but maybe, but we don't know the conversation. Maybe they were asking for a Casper Capitan. You you don't know. Maybe they were trying to get the best deal they possibly could. The Philadelphia Flyers were, And maybe it was just a guy that Kyle Dubas wasn't willing to part with. Well, it's clear that Connor Brown was the chip that they were trying to wave. And Philly was just like, nah, we're good, thanks. And honestly, I can't blame Philly because Connor Brown has been less than stellar all season long. Yeah, like, let's let's not sit here and be like, it's just... Just because you can't stand a player on the Leafs doesn't make him... Usually, if you can't stand a player on the Leafs, that means other teams don't want him either. Like, don't act like the the crap player on your team is the player that other teams want just because you want to get rid of them. It doesn't work like that. So, before we move on, we'll talk about some other things that happened on today's deadline day. I wanted to point this out. Did you see a couple of the clips floating around today of Brian Burke just going off about the Maple Leafs at least twice today. There were two instances in particular. There was one where he was talking about their cap window, and he's just literally screaming at the camera. I highly encourage you to go find it. It's it's jarring just how animated he is. He's like, their cap window is closing, so Nylander will be gone. Jake Gardner will be gone. It's not about how old the players are. It's about the cap window that's closing. And it was just kind of like, Brian, like relax, buddy. Then he had another one where he went off about the Leafs' toughness and just criticized them for not addressing and not caring about toughness. So it was just kind of interesting how he took took the opportunity to take a couple shots at Leaf management with respect to those two things. 
Well, when he, whenever Brian Burke offers a take, you got to just kind of like, you know, like you respect Brian Burke because he's been in the league so long. He's seen every situation. You can't just discredit him because you think he's an idiot. Like the guy has a ton of experience. He's run a lot of hockey teams. He's been a general manager for multiple hockey teams, but he had a sour time in this city. Okay. Like let's not pretend that didn't happen. And he can go on the radio all he wants and say, Oh, well, the people just chirp me because they think I'm sour about the Maple Leafs and he can deny it. But we deep down, you always have some sort of feeling about a hockey team that you that fired you or just let you go of your job because you didn't do your job. So maybe we can agree with him with the toughness scenario. But Brian Burke has an attachment to a guy like Jake Gardner because he was there when they acquired him and when they were developing him and putting him in the lineup. So when Brian Burke goes off about Jake Garner and Jake Garner leaving, I think I could speak for almost every fan of this team in this city. No one is going to miss Jake Garner when he leaves. No, no one. Okay? Absolutely not. I like, I, I get it. He's a, he's a quote unquote. He's a good puck moving defense, but he's an offensive defenseman on a night to night basis. He really doesn't contribute much offensively. You look at the top offensive defenseman in the league. Brett Burns for the San Jose Sharks. He has 70 points right now. That's an offensive defenseman. Not Jake Gardner. I'm sorry. Let's uh, Jay, Brian Burke just has a weird attachment to Jake Gardner. He needs to let go of it. Lee fans know that we will not miss him whatsoever. Yeah, he had so, him in Anaheim as well. Let's not forget that. Yeah, so let's let's like we get it. The Leafs aren't tough enough to out tough the Bruins. Like you even saw it a bit on Saturday night. Like Domi started getting a little physical. No one really had an answer, but they won the game, so who cares? But we we get the toughness, but don't go off about their cap situation. Every good hockey team, the Tampa Bay Lightning, they're in a cap crunch right now, too. Like, it's not just the Leafs. Like, I don't believe in this one year we got to win the cup this year window. So, a couple more notes from trade deadline, non-Leaf related. Obviously, probably the biggest move of the day was the Ottawa Senators trading Mark Stone to the Vegas Golden Knights. And the most interesting part about that is immediately after they traded him, it was announced that Stone had signed an eight-year, $9.5 million extension with the Golden Knights. Overpaid. Holy man, that's overpaying for a guy like that. I'm sorry. Yep. That's a gross overpay for that hockey team. Today was a bit of an arms race in the West, I found. You had Vegas picking up Mark Stone. You had Nashville picking up Wayne Simmons. You had the Jets picking up Kevin Hayes from the New York Rangers. So it was like it was less about the Eastern Conference and more about the Western Conference. The only team in the East that's made a big splash, and this has been over the last couple days, is obviously the Columbus Blue Jackets picking up Matt Duchesne. Ryan Dezingle and Adam McQuaid, who was linked to the Leafs for the last few days. So the Columbus Blue Jackets have decided this is the year they're going to try and go for broke. Well, can you blame Yarmo Kekalainen? Like, you got two superstar players, one in a goalie in Bobrovsky, one in a forward in Panarin, who it's kind of common knowledge around hockey that those two guys are dipping out of town after this season. So if you're Yarmo, it's like, Do I tell... This is what people don't get, okay? Columbus isn't Toronto, okay? In Toronto, you can rebuild. You can do whatever you want. Fans will still show up. Fans will still pay their money. But when you're in a place like Columbus, a hockey market that's kind of like, you know... You've got to win. It's not too great. If you're an opportunity to make the playoffs and make a bit of a run, then you have to go for it. Because what are you going to do? Like, you can't just say to your fans that... Like, that's a, that's a college football town. Like, that's an Ohio State Buckeyes town, okay? This isn't a Columbus Blue Jackets town. So when you have a chance to go out and go far in the playoffs and do something, then you have to take it. So I have to really, really respect Yarmo for going out and adding to his team and giving them a shot to go deep in the playoffs. Do you like their chances? Well, right now they're still like fighting for a playoff spot. Like, let's not pretend they're 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 like gone in that division. Like, they're still fighting in that wild card race with Carolina and Pittsburgh and Montreal. So they have to make the playoffs at first. Seventy three points. I think they'll be fine. Like, I think they'll make the playoffs. One thing you like about that McQuaid ad is that's just more. They're already a tough team. They're a big team that can hit you and 
be physical, play a physical style. So if you add McQuaid, that helps do it. And then you add Dezingle and Deshane. Personally, I'm not the biggest Matt Deshane fan. No, I think... But if you throw Matt Deshane in on a tough hockey team, then I think that gives you a good, like, skill dynamic. Like, it doesn't hurt to add two really skilled hockey players who are having both pretty good years it can contribute offensively to a team that's already pretty tough and pretty big i'm with you on duchene i he's definitely a complimentary piece as opposed to like a stud that you can build around no doubt about it yeah 100 percent. but like his skill set comes off as a guy you can like build around but we've he's been in the league long enough and you know now that like this is a guy he's not going to take control he could guy you can really chip in offensively but if he's not the main guy, it really helps him push him down to the depth chart a little bit. But if you look at their center ice position, like it's still not really that strong. But I think they're going to make the playoffs. I think they're going to be just fine. I I have to I have to get the, this little little dig in here, Ryan. The Edmonton Oilers did a whole lot of nothing today. So as far as I'm concerned. Unless some sort of miracle drops out of the sky that no one sees coming, the clock is on them. We are counting down the days until Connor McDavid goes to management and says, get me out of here. Well, it's just like, they've done enough. Like, they're just trying to recoup Peter Shirelli's mess of contracts that that guy signed. They, they're right up against the cap and they're brutal. Like oh, yeah, if you brutal. look at the West, like really they're, they're, they're not, they're not going to make the playoffs, but they're not like dead last. But if you look at the, the bottom teams in the NHL, like they, they could have a chance of in that lottery to, of getting that top position again. Like don't, don't rule that out, man. Like they, they, they could luck in again. You never know. Right. The last time they're currently sitting third last in the NHL. The last time they won the lottery, when they got Connor McDavid, they finished third last in the NHL. Yeah, like, this is a very lucky hockey team. No one in Canada, other than the people who live in Edmonton or people around the country who are Oilers fans, want to see that team win the lottery again. You had your chance. You traded away. You're looking for wingers. You traded away your two scoring wingers for nothing. So I hope they don't win that lottery. And I'm not surprised they didn't do anything today because they're brutal. They're up against the cap. And... You know what? They had it coming to them, signing all those guys to ridiculous contracts. All right. Before we get into uh, tonight's uh, W over the Buffalo Sabres, I just want to touch on the Leafs one more time. Ryan, this is officially the roster that we're headed into the postseason with, it looks like. Give me your thoughts on it. What do you think? Are you happy? Are you not happy? What are your overall thoughts now, including the Nick Patan acquisition? Well, we don't know what Nick Patan like. We we can't sit here and speculate if he's gonna be added on the fourth line or not. I think today, the top nine, nothing's changed. It's the same top nine. Kadri's injured. We're seeing a, a bit of Nylander at center. But I think getting rid of Parland home. Yeah, Parland home was a good pro. I'm famous for the second episode. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. What was Parland home? It's good pro, good player. He's got a good veteran. He's got a good family. He's got a couple kids at home. He's got to take care of them. Oh, yeah. But it's just like, you know what? Like, I respect penalty killers. I, I've, i like, you need a good penalty kill. At least penalty kill is not that great right now. But it's it's sometimes when a player, you can't find a specific role for him, you go, you know what? You could play the penalty kill. But I think getting rid of Parland home and having Tyler Ennis – Trevor Moore or even Nick Batan on that fourth line is going to improve that line offensively. And you saw it tonight. They contributed with two goals. And it's just it I think I think the fourth line's improved. And say what you want about the fourth line. Like, yeah, Freddie Gauthier only had seven minutes tonight. Trevor Moore only just had below seven minutes of ice time, but that was a very efficient, productive seven minutes of ice time those guys had tonight. All right, Rye. Before we get into tonight's big 5-3 win over the Buffalo Sabres, I just want to touch a little bit on Saturday night's come-from-behind W over the Montreal Canadiens. Probably one of the more emotional Leaf games in recent memory. 
Like tensions were running high in that game. You saw the videos of the players chirping each other from the benches. I love those videos, by the way. Can we just talk about John Tavares chirping? Like, what, oh, what, yeah. do, you, what I know. do you think he, he says? He stuck the glove up to the ear and he goes, what? What, what are you saying now, bud? Oh, yeah, I can't hear you. But you just know that, like, JT probably doesn't have the best chirps. No, no. I can almost promise you that JT does not have the best chirps. Yeah, he's not a guy who knows. That's why Kapanen had to step in there for him a little bit, I think. And I'm sure Kasper Kapanen's not a world champion of chirps either. But you know what, Ryan? It's the old cliche goes. You win on the scoreboard, and that's exactly what the Maple Leafs did. Well, to take a little side note for a second with the whole Trade Center thing, you know, I was listening to the radio this morning, and they had callers in trying to fill in time, and one guy comes on, and he's like, you know what? The Maple Leafs should be absolutely embarrassed on how they played on Saturday. They got absolutely pushed around. And it's like, you hear something like that. Like, I turned it off immediately after that. Like, Ryan, there's a huge contingent of the fan base that feels that way. Like, yeah, this cringe-worthy, is cringeworthy, man. Like, come on. Like, it's just, I get it. Okay. Johnson took a clean hit in his own zone. Big deal. That is arguably the biggest comeback of the Matthews Marner era. Three zip down to the Montreal Canadiens. You bounce back, you win the game. And don't give me this, that was embarrassing. That's ridiculous. I am sorry. I get it that they're not tough enough. They don't have enough grit. But don't give me that. That is just a stupid take. And you should just take off your leave jersey forever if you think that. That's ridiculous. Calling it embarrassing is a bit of a stretch. I'll admit. That's that's, that's ridiculous. It's it's, it's out, out of this world ridiculous. Rob, my brother, got a little question for you. What's that, Ryan? If people are unaware about the Talk of Buds podcast, where can they hear us? Where can they find us? Well, Ryan, they can hear the show on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and YouTube. They can also follow our daily posts on Instagram at Talking Buds Podcast, on Twitter at Talking Buds Pod, and do not forget to hit that little subscribe button and leave a little five-star review and be a absolute bod. Thank you for the support, everybody. Now, let's get back to the Toronto Maple Leaf Podcast for all the buds. This is the Talking Buds Podcast. We've teased this long enough. Let's get into it here. The Maple Leafs defeating the Buffalo Sabres tonight by a score of 5-3. to three. Ryan, it was the most typical Maple Leaf win of the season. It's how they play. It's how they win. They come out in the first period. No one looks like they're interested. No one looks like they want to be there. They get outshot 16-6. Jack Eichel scores towards the end of the period, and the Sabres take a 1-0 lead into the first intermission. Now, before we proceed, Ryan, why in God's name can this team just not start a game on time? To quote Babs, I'm starting on time. Why in God's name does it take them a period to get going? Well, I kind of hit on it last week. It's like they can only play one style of game, and we saw that later in the game. But if there's a point in any sort of hockey game where the Leafs are struggling, it's kind of a point in the game where like the skill's not really taking over, and it's about just working hard for pucks, working, working hard for pucks, working hard in battles, and it, they just have a hard time doing that. So when the skill isn't pushing through, they have a hard time. They're kind of a one-trick pony almost. Like, they have a hard time adapting their game and changing it to like, okay, right now this game isn't allowing the stretch pass, isn't allowing the free lanes to the Buffalo net. So what you got to do is change up your style a little bit, 
win some puck battles, get the puck to the net into some dirty areas, work hard, but they really have a hard time doing that. And that's kind of the story of the season. So when things aren't going well on the skill side, they're not getting those stretch pass breakaways or two on ones or odd man rushes, then they really have a hard time adapting their game to that hard working style. So I feel like that's why sometimes early in the game when it's not so open and free, they have a hard time because they don't really have that like edge, that work hard ability to score those dirty goals or win those dirty battles. So I feel like that's why they sometimes they struggle coming out of the gate. Five straight games in which they've allowed the first goal to their opponent. Yeah, like it's just that it's just it's just not coming out to play. It's just not like sometimes like you just gotta come out early. Sometimes you gotta work a little harder than the skill doesn't always come. The stretch passes don't always come. Like you got to work for them. You got to open them up. It's like in football. If you just pass the ball all game, then the the, the defense is going to know that they're going to have to adjust their defense to stop the pass. If you run the ball and the it's successful, then it's going to open up the pass game. And that's why I feel like with their grit and toughness, sometimes you just got to work a little bit harder to get those great opportunities you're looking for later in the hockey game. Ryan, what comes before the skill? The will. The, the will, will before the skill. Yeah. <laughs> the will before the skill. And it's lame, and it's a hockey cliche, and you got to work hard. You may have all the talent in the world, but if you don't work, it's not going to come easy. But the, you know what? It wouldn't be a saying if there wasn't some truth to it. And... I feel like that's why sometimes when they come out and they're a little soft and they're a little sluggish early, they just don't know how to get themselves into a hockey game other than scoring some stretch pass goal. They can't get themselves into a hockey game by laying a big hit or working hard or whatever. Like they just got to, what gets them into the game is when they finally start, when the other team allows them to start playing that stretch pass game, which is exactly what happened tonight. Yep. They came out for the second period. It looked like a completely different team. I just said that it's five straight games in which they've allowed the first goal. So presumably five straight first intermissions in which Babcock has completely chewed them out. So they came out looking like a completely different team. They go on the power play. They hit two posts on the power play. And then immediately after it gets back to even strength, Jake Muzzin blasts one from the point. Point. Johnny T tips it. We got a tie game. One minute and 36 seconds later, Austin Matthews scores his 30th goal of the season. Seconds after that, the MVP of tonight's game, Freddie the Goat, makes it 3 1. The Leafs score three goals in two minutes and three seconds. Classic Leafs. You can totally get away with being asleep for a period because you have enough goal scoring talent to get you out of a jam like that one and it's almost like they play that way it's like they play this sort of like if we fall behind we're confident in our scoring ability to get us back into a game well yeah it's just it's just we again we hit it on last week it's it the buffalo sabers after the first period allowed the toronto maple leafs to play their game and that was stretch pass Find a guy streaking down the neutral zone into the O zone, and you see what happened. Boom, 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 boom. Lucky bounce to Matthews. Tavares working hard in front of the net, but then you saw it on Tyler Ennis' goal. It's like there's Tyler Ennis streaking up the ice, gets a good pass, comes in, finishes. This team can finish. We know that. It's just can you find another way to put the puck in the net in April? That doesn't involve a stretch pass or the way you usually get goals because when it gets the when it gets tough in April, you gotta find other ways to score. Who got the assist on Tyler and assist goal to make it four one? Freddie the Goat. Yes, he did. Freddie the Goat took note of the Nick Batan acquisition today and realized oh my God, this guy could potentially take my job and had one of his better games of the season. Cool no coincidence Jonas Siegel tweets immediately after that Trevor Moore has assisted in all three of Freddie's goals this season and Trevor Moore's only played seven games this year so to your earlier point this bringing up Trevor Moore is long overdue Bob McKenzie said during the intermission this is the management and Babcock feel he's earned this promotion and Man, I love the guy. He he's he better be in the lineup every game as long as he's healthy for the rest of the season, in my opinion. 
Well, I don't want to be smartest guy in the room because on this podcast, through all the episodes we've done, I've been wrong a lot. But I've been saying all year that every time I've seen Trevor Moore on that fourth line, even if even when Par Lindholm was on the other wing, forget Ennis, even when it was Gautier Lindholm Moore, Trevor Moore made an absolute monumental difference in that line because he brings speed and he could also bring skill. And when he's on that line, he just brings a totally different element. And tonight was the perfect example of what that guy does when he's on that line. So Leafs go up 4-1. We start to kick our feet up. We're like, we're going to run away with this. And then boom, Sam Reinhardt scores on a 5-on-3. Yeah, it was a tough one. Five yeah. on three. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Like, it's like makes, you know. Makes it 4-2. So you're like, Zaitsev okay. Zaitsev takes the penalty. Oh, Thanks, Nikita. He's, Ryan, you, my feelings on Nikita Zaitsev are well documented on this podcast. He you might as well stinks. just You might as well just throw an open grenade on a stick yeah. when the puck's on it. Jesus. Can't even. Like, what has happened to that guy? Anyway. They take a 4-2 lead into the second intermission. They come out to start the third, and Jack Eichel, who can be added to the Leaf Killer list, scores his second of the game, makes it 4-3. Jack Eichel can shoot the puck, my friend. Oh, yeah. Well, he's a, he's a beast. And I feel like him and Austin Matthews, like, the feeling I get with them two is they ran in, like, different American circles. And I feel like Jack Eichel and Austin Matthews, like, yeah, they played in the U.S. development program, but I feel like both of them are kind of just like, mm, I don't like you and you don't like me, and we're both going to bring it when we play each other. They because do. I thought Austin Matthews, you know what, like, you got, you got a goal and you're still looking for that Nikita Kucherov night from Austin Matthews, those kind of four-point nights, but I thought Austin Matthews brought it tonight. He was extremely noticeable. He had the puck all the time. He was around the puck all the time, so I thought he brought it up tonight. Austin Matthews is the first Maple Leaf in history to have three 30-goal seasons to start his career. Which is just, like, for a franchise that is so popular and so historic, so historic, if you look at when the original six ended till now, like what? It, it, honestly, it's been a joke, man. Like it's been a joke. How could you not have one guy score thirty goals in his first three seasons? That shows you the just the awful draft yeah, and development. You just took the words. You just took the words that right this out of hockey my mouth. team has had for for decades. And I get that this kind of era of the if the league is more about drafting and developing and how young guys are taking over but if you look at other great teams across the decades they drafted their players and they came up and they were superstars for them and if you look at this hockey team over the past couple decades like it, it's been it's been borderline atrocious when it comes to drafting and developing oh it hasn't been since until Brendan Shanahan came in here that the drafting and development has actually done anything like, my whole life as a Leaf fan, I never remember them drafting somebody and them developing into a star until this new modern era with the Shanna plan. Like, never. Yeah. Well, it, to be fair to, to, to guys before, like Nazem Kadri, they draft him, develop him. Morgan Riley, draft him, develop. So they've done it over the past, like, 10 or so years. But how can you go for that many years and just not have guys that you've drafted and developed have this kind of success. Like, even, like, you th- you think about Morgan Riley in the Norris race this year. Like, his name's brought up all the time. Like, how is this hockey team, like, not have a defenseman who's won a Norris in the past couple of decades? Like, it's just unbelievable to think about. It is unbelievable to think about. Anyways, let's finish off our wrap-up of this game. So, the Leafs hold on 4-3. 2.45 left in the third period. The undisputed MVP of the Maple Leafs, Freddie Anderson, absolute larceny, to quote Joe Bowen, on Darlene to keep the game at 4-3, and then boom, Kasperi Kapanen goes back the other way, shorthanded, scores to make it 5-3, and that is your final score. Ryan, we could literally name this podcast the Freddie Anderson Show. There's just... if. We all love Matthews, we love Marner, we love Johnny T, we love Willie, we love Naz, we love all the stars, but it's just like, man, this team is not anywhere close to the team they are without Freddie 
back there. Yeah, he made a that save he made on Palmanville too in the third period. That was that was ridiculous. Did but. you see the accidental like jump cut that they had to the panel and O-Dog, yeah, 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 yeah. O-Dog's face was yeah. just like oh yeah yeah that was amazing yeah, yeah that was hilarious but. This, but like again, we we come back to the stretch pass. It's like if you're gonna play the stretch pass, chance for chance game, then that means well, you're that's gonna the game trade chances. Play. Yeah, that's the, that means you're trading chances on both ends, and that means your goalie has to come up for you massive when it's his turn to make the save. And that's it, it, to me, it's crazy. We don't really we haven't really talked about this much this year, but in the past with Freddie Anderson, there's always been those stretches where people have been like, ah, Freddie, whatever. But I feel like this year he's hit a point where he's kind of bulletproof with the fan base. He's a legit Vesna contender, in my opinion. Yeah, like he he's kind of hit bulletproof status with the fan base. I, I don't think once all year I've heard murmurs about Freddie Anderson's performance because people are starting to understand that if you don't have a guy like him back there, like this hockey team's nowhere. No, like, you got I, no I just, chance. You got all the talent in the world. I get it. Tons of skill. But if this guy doesn't stop those chances in this chance for chance type of hockey that the Maple Leafs play, then you don't you don't have a chance to win anything. Ryan, he makes two to three ten bell saves a night. A night. Yeah, it's it's the defense, like he's got he's got Nikita Zaitsev and Jake Gardner in front of him. You're not winning anything unless you can make those big saves on a nightly basis, and that's exactly what Freddie Anderson does. Yeah, honestly. But I got a question for you quick. All right, lay it on. Okay. Me. Looking at the ice time tonight, we everyone the ice time has been a big there's been tons of storylines this year. There's been the power play, Ron Hainsey. All that, but you look at the ice time again tonight, and Austin Matthews is at 18, just over 18 minutes a night. So where are you at with the Austin Matthews ice time? Because there's guys like Mark Shifley out there who are getting 21 minutes a night. Tons of top centers getting more minutes than he is. So where are you at with the Matthews ice time debate? How much ice time did John Tavares have? I believe John Tavares just had over 20 minutes of ice time. So it's relatively even with Johnny T. So that that doesn't bother me. Uh, it's just, I don't know, man. Like, it, it all comes back to, to Babcock and his, his weird methods. Listen, if he wants to roll along the regular season doing this, that's fine. But when you get into the playoffs, if Matthews is still going to be under 20 minutes, you're not going to win. Like, I'd like to have... Like, I'd like to make a special shout out right now to Brian Hayes on TSN 1050 because he made he made the point that I wholeheartedly believe last week, okay? If this team is going to do anything in the postseason, it's not going to be because they go and get a tough guy who plays eight minutes a night and drops the mitts every now and then. It's going to be because Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, John Tavares, Willie Nylander, Nazem Kadri decide they're going to take over a game. Morgan Riley, all those guys decide they're going to take over a game. And so Babs has to know going into the postseason that that's how he's going to win. So if you're going to keep throwing Freddy the Goat out there, which I don't think he'll do. If you look at his track record in the postseason, he doesn't really roll that fourth line very much. But like... You, you, your studs are going to be what wins games for you in the postseason. So if this is just you're trying to evenly distribute the ice time in the regular season, fine. But come playoff time, those horses are going to be what gets you to the promised land. So it, I'm going to have a serious problem if Austin Matthews is below 20 minutes a night in the play, Unless he stinks, which I don't see coming. I'm going to have a serious problem if he's under 20 minutes a night in the postseason. Yeah, like, uh, well, correction on me, John Tavares was just over 19 minutes tonight. So there you so go. It's it, basically it was, a, even. it was a minute difference. But are you in the camp of, like, this guy's making eleven point six three four million a year, so if you're going to pay a guy that much, then you better put him on the ice for 20 mon- minutes a night and see what he can do. Because personally for me, I'm kind of in that camp too. So am I, but he's, he's a, here's the thing. He's a kid and I don't think Babcock likes his play in the defensive zone. He's never come out and outright said that, but if Babcock is keeping his minutes limited like that, there's a reason for it. And when I watch Matthews play, he does get a little, 
questionable in his own end. So I'm trying to understand what it is that Babcock sees that prevents him from putting him out there more. So that's the only answer I've been able to come up with. So he's still a kid. He's still young. He's got to work out those kinks in the defensive zone. But come playoff time, man, like I just said, I could see that going up because that's how they're going to win. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you and Hayes on that for sure. Like, it's it, it's like, let's not pretend adding a fourth line grit grinder is going to drop the glove. It's going to change the whole complexion of that first round. No, it's going to be the big boys and deciding they want to step up and contribute and win that series. That's my whole thing with these guys who are just so, like, adamant about the toughness thing. It's like, listen... They're, they have to play tougher, but the guys on the team have to do that. Like, you saw the clip of the game in Montreal the other night of Matthew shoving Shea Weber on his ass, and it's like, yes, that's what we need. It's like, you, you can't go get, like, Adam McQuaid was everybody's favorite, like, we're going to get Adam McQuaid. It's like, one, whose spot is he going to take in the defense? I, you tell me. I have no idea. Two, sticking him out there, sure, he drops the mitts every now and then. It's like, the, the Leafs... They're going to beat Boston because they, they're going to be first on pucks. They're going to outskill them. They're going to outwork them. They're going to win battles. They're not going to get intimidated and let guys like Brad Marchand get in their head. That's how they're going to win. They're not going to win because they're, they're going to go get Adam McQuaid and he's going to punch Brad Marchand in the face. Like, that's just, that's that's not how it's going to work. So, like, sorry to burst your bubble, folks. I'm somebody who's, listen, I'm not a hater, I'm somebody who's like a proponent of like, yes, you need to be a little tougher and you need to have more of a mean streak. But these guys in that room have to develop that within themselves. Bringing in an outside person to just play on the fourth line and fight is not going to make a difference. Sorry. Yeah, and you heard, and if you did get a chance to listen to Kyle Dubas on TSN 1050 today do his interview, he was saying that he wasn't going to compromise talent in his lineup for hypothetical grit or toughness or a guy who can drop the gloves. And this is this team's philosophy. Like we just have to get used to that. Like it's just, if you want them to go out and act like the, the flyers, the seventies, eighties flyers, that's just not the way this team's going to operate. We would all love to see some guy be tough as ever and go drop the gloves and beat the crap out of someone. But we know that this is not how the NHL works or if you're just talking about grit and toughness and Tom Wilson kind of hockey playing ability, this hockey team isn't going to play like that. So we just have to get over it and just hope that this hockey team can use their strengths to their advantage to win that, to win a couple of rounds in the playoffs or even win that first round. Ryan, what time is it, buddy? Bums and beauties. <laughs> It's time to find out who's a bum and who's a beauty. Take it away, buds. That's right. It is bums and beauties. Ryan, I'd like to go first if you don't mind. Yes, please. My beauty of the week is Zach Hyman. This guy has taken his fair share of flack over the last few years, especially when he was paired with Matthews the last couple of years. I don't see nearly as many people chirping his role in the top six anymore. He brings it every night. He is one of, if not the hardest working guy on the team. He scored a few big goals lately. He got the big go ahead goal against the Habs the other night. I just, you know what? Say what you will about him. Is he the most skilled guy in the world? No, but he, that guy brings it every single shift and no one is saying anything about him being on that line with Marner and Tavares. They are the Leafs top line. So Zach Hyman, you are my beauty of the week. Yes. Good pick. Zach Hyman leaves a little bit to desire offensively, but you cannot deny that this guy brings it every single shift. And he even mentions that in a Sokoloff Lawyers commercial on, on the radio. <laughs> he always grinds in the corners and gives 110. 
He sure does, Ryan. Yes. Okay. My beauty of the week is Trevor Moore. Oh, Even though he go. hasn't been in the lineup, it's really only for tonight. But personally, I'm a huge fan of this kid. And I'm a huge fan of a guy who isn't a high draft pick, a high first rounder, and a guy who just works and works and works and skills and skills and skills until he is so successful in the AHL that you can't even ignore his success and bring him up to the NHL. And the small sample size we've seen this guy so far earlier in the year, he was really impressive. And he came up tonight, and he was really impressive again. And I know he only had seven minutes of ice time, but sometimes that seven minutes can make an absolute huge difference in a hockey game, and it did tonight. And I think this guy is going to stick around. I think he's going to be on this hockey team. He's one of those guys who you're going to have to plug into one of those winger spots because you're going to lose a couple of guys because of the salary cap. So I'm going to give this guy his respect. He's my beauty of the week because he's just one of those hardworking individuals who's earned his spot on this hockey team. Let's give a special shout out in the beauty of the week segment tonight from both of us because he we'd never get picked otherwise. So let's give him his due right now. Freddie the Goat had a great game tonight against Buffalo. He deserves a pat on the back. He played very well. boy, Freddie. All right, bum of the week. The last few weeks I've gone off the board and taken like a non-leaf and done a like around the league thing. So tonight I'm going to bring it back in and pick a leaf. Stop me if you've heard this before. I won't go into a huge rant. You've already heard me say this a million times. Nikita Zaitsev stinks. Just brutal. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over it. Kyle Find a way to do something about the Nikita Zaitsev problem in the offseason because this guy is just drives me insane every time I watch him. He makes, you know, the only positive about Nikita Zaitsev is he makes me forget about his partner, Jake Gardner, because he's just so brutal night in and night out. Nikita Zaitsev, congratulations. You are once again my bum of the week. Yes, honorable. I I second that, honestly. Like, just, the guy's brutal. But my bum of the week is just, I mentioned it earlier, just the the Toronto Maple Leaf fans who are just so irrational and just, you know what? Like, we get it. We all need grit and toughness. But just don't be one of those Toronto Maple Leaf fans who are the bum of the week, who go on the radio and talk about the embarrassment that Saturday was, even though they came back from a three-goal deficit deficit in one probably one of the biggest hockey games they have in in years like just don't be that guy like we me and you do this podcast and we want to be rationally fans and we get their downsides we get their upsides but don't be a super fan or a fan of this team and call into radio shows and just be absolutely irrational and ridiculous so all those leaf fans who just cannot be pleased always looking for something that they don't have and don't see what they actually have and just always look for that great, better thing that they want and just ignore everything that's in front of them. You're my bum of the week. Well, it's like, again, it it comes back to like the whole toughness thing because that's that's what these, these types of people go on about. And it's just like, I get that like you get frustrated with the whole toughness thing, but it's like, guys... Going out and getting an Adam McQuaid, they're not going to beat Boston because they went and got Adam McQuaid. Like, they're going to beat Boston because Austin Matthews decides, I'm going to be first on every puck in the corner. Mitch Marner decides, I'm going to be first on every puck in the corner. I'm going to skate my ass off and skate circles around this slower Boston team. That's how they're going to win. They're not going to win because they go and get somebody who plays eight minutes a night and fights like it's not gonna happen so it's just like that's it's like and it's like don't bring up tom wilson count on one hand how many tom wilson's there are in the nhl there's one other his name's ryan reeves and that's it and even then ryan reeves tough guy but ryan reeves doesn't have 16 goals like tom wilson does tom wilson's a bit of a unicorn in this league right now he's a guy who can lay the body scare everyone on the ice and can also pot 20 a year even after being suspended for like 15 games okay so that's a unicorn don't go out and make comparables for other hockey teams and i agree with you getting one guy isn't going to change your whole dynamic it's the way that some teams are built it's just 
the way they've drafted, the way they've traded, the way they've signed free agents, it's all come together in kind of a, a gritty skill that some Leaf fans are dying for. But this is not what this hockey team is. And maybe getting one guy to throw, drop the gloves one time would be nice, but it's not going to decide a seven-game series against any hockey team in this league. Amen, Ryan. And speaking of seven-game series against a hockey team in this league, the Maple Leafs currently sit one point behind the Boston Bruins at The Bruins have 81 points. The Leafs have 80. So they're going to spend the rest of the season jockeying for home ice advantage, which that should be all the motivation you need. I don't want to go to TD Garden for another Game 7 ride. No, I don't either. And it's just, at the end of the day, we want home ice advantage. But even if you don't get it, you got to just bear down and win a series Last year, if we think this Maple Leafs team is better than they were last year, they got to seven games with that hockey team last year. And honestly, me and you both thought they didn't play that well in that series. They got dominated for most of that series, but yet we were leading going into the third period of that game seven. So let's not just like, like you got to slay the dragon at some point, whether it's home ice, not home ice, you got to slay the dragon. All right, so we've got a three-game and four-night stretch coming up this week, Ryan. Wednesday night, my man, Mac T, and the Edmonton Oilers come to town. I should say Connor McDavid and the Edmonton Oilers, but uh, everybody who's listening to the show knows how much I love Craig McTavish and Kevin Lowe and Bob Nicholson. So the Edmonton Oilers brain trust comes to Scotiabank Arena to take on the Maple Leafs and what is will f- as long as they play for these two teams will always be billed as Matthews versus McDavid. Oh yeah, and, and McDavid's coming off his his two game suspension, coming back to his hometown, so he'll be fired up. Then the very next night, the Maple Leafs go to the Coliseum to take on the New York Islanders. Johnny T goes back to New York. Do you think he'll get booed? I think oh, he will. Dude, he'll get destroyed in that building. He, who's going to get it? And it makes it worse, too, because they're good. So now it's kind of just like, oh, we never needed you in the first place. Is like, he going to get it worse than Kawhi Leonard got it in San Antonio? Yeah, it would probably be comparable. I, I could see this guy getting booed out of the building. So it, what are you doing with goalies in that back-to-back? Like, if it's me, I'm starting Sparks on Wednesday night at home against the crap Oilers. And you're going into the Coliseum. It's going to be a super hostile environment. The Islanders are going to come out flying. Garrett Sparks, just, I'm sorry. Like, I know there's a bunch of people who love Garrett Sparks, but, like, eh... Like, I'd rather have my guy Freddie back there who's going to need to make a big saver five in the first period to keep the Leafs in the game. So that's what I would do. But who the hell knows what Babcock's going to do? Yeah, in a perfect world, like, every, anyone would start Anderson against the better team in a back-to-back, whether that's the first game or the second game. But NHL coaches, just, they don't, th- I don't know what it is. They just don't think like that. They're just go, you know what, I'm going to play my best guy the first night. And play my backup the second night. And I just see Mike Babcock doing that against the Islanders. I see Garrett Sparks starting that game. Well, I guess the logic there is you want to put Anderson in against the Oilers and get the for sure two points. And then just take your chances with Sparks in Long Island. Yeah, like at some point, like I, I'm not a big as a Garrett Sparks hater or lover as other people. I just, just don't like, like his. I, I just think I, this is a team that they struggle defensively. This is the thing with Sparks. I I don't question Sparks like ability. I think one of the reasons why Freddie Anderson is so crucial to this team is the way he plays the position and his demeanor as a person. He's really calm, cool, and collected. And when you get a team that gets as frantic defensively as the Leafs do it helps them a lot to have a guy back there who can just stay calm and make those saves and Sparks gets swimming he gets rattled he looks rattled he looks like he starts breathing heavy and all it's like I think that that's my thing with Garrett Sparks like just just keep keep your composure yeah yeah you see he's kind of just flopping all over the net I, I agree and then Saturday night, a rematch at Scotiabank Arena from tonight, the Buffalo Sabres. And the Sabres always play the Leafs tough, and they're going to be pissed off after what happened tonight. So that is going to be no cakewalk. Well, don't they have, like, a repeat of the schedule from this week to next week? Like, don't they play this, the, the Oilers again? 
next, so they play the Sabres Monday, and then they go out west. So, no, no, they play the Sabres Saturday, excuse me. They play the Sabres Saturday night on Hockey Night in Canada. And then Monday night, they go out west and play the Calgary Flames. Wednesday, they play the Vancouver Canucks. And then next Saturday, they're in Edmonton to play the Oilers. Yeah, so there's that Western Canadian trip, and it's just... It's going to be a tough trip, man. Like, it, oh, the dude, Oilers, like, the Oilers sure. are a bit of a joke. But with the Maple Leafs, we know that we can't expect easy W's out of this team anymore, you know? You just never know how they're going to come out and play against certain hockey teams. Like, we saw how they came out and play against Arizona a couple weekends ago, and that was brutal. So we can't be so confident going into this Western trip. And Calgary's a damn good hockey team. Bunch of, uh, they did the top five picks today on the tsn uh trade deadline show with like top five picks to win the stanley cup and calgary was in a whole lot of those picks from a lot of the analysts the leafs weren't in any of them by the way yeah the the, the flames do not have the goaltending to win a stanley cup i i'm sorry if you're a calgary flame fan or someone who believes in that hockey team who's gonna win the stanley cup but that team just does not have the goaltending to go all the way <sighs> well ryan We'll have to wait and see. I think that'll do it for episode 21 of Talking Buds. By the way, I want to give a shout out to your buddy and now my buddy and the show's buddy, Ryan Miller, for repping us on Instagram with the Talking Buds hat. If anybody would like a Talking Buds hat, hit us up on Instagram. We'd be happy to send one to you. They're really nice hats, aren't they, Ryan? Absolutely. And just be be a bud. That's all we're asking. Be Talking a- buds, be a bud, wear the hat, wear it to the gym, wear it to a family dinner, wear it to church. I don't care. Rep it. Rep Just the talking rep buds. Rep it. Rep the talking buds. Spread the word. If you love the podcast, it's you want a hat, week. we'll send it to you no matter what it takes. Be a bud. Thank you, everybody, for downloading. We will catch